Hello, I'm Dr. Debra e. Jones, but most folks know me as DJ, my nickname since the fourth grade. At this moment, I'm living my best life and doing what I continue to love for 48 years as an educator. Learning, teaching, leading, and laughing. I'm a retired principal, assistant principal, teacher, athletic coach, and certified mentor. I own Educational Leadership Consulting, LLC, providing coaching, training, and consulting services to educators, leaders, and managers of government agencies and nonprofit organizations. Today, I want to discuss the value and necessity of relationships and how to establish them to ensure student learning and academic success, especially for poor performing students. Be prepared for a lot of thought-provoking questions. I ask questions to help people reflect. I see reflection as a tool for growth and change. Reflection allows you to look back at where you've been and what you learned, but it also helps you to anticipate and prepare for where you're going. So today, we will reflect and learn about relationships for learning. Why do relationships matter in the teaching learning process? I attended a conference several years ago where the presenters discussed the three R's in education. Now, people in my generation would immediately assume the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, which was the case in the 20th century. But these speakers discussed a new version of the three R's for the 21st century, rigor, relevance, and relationships. Rigor is about exposing students to challenging work with academic and social support. Just don't give kids work and then not help them with the work. Relevance means demonstrating how students will use their learning. Can they apply what you taught them? Relationships build caring and supportive connections with students, parents, and the communities. It takes everybody to educate a child. For our children to succeed in school and society, we must provide rigorous instruction, assignments, and assessments that are on grade level, challenging, and relevant in preparing them to live productive and meaningful lives. Our students require 21st century knowledge, skills, and experiences that prepare them for predictable and unpredictable situations. They have to develop their thinking and problem-solving skills. As educators, we must ensure our students know and understand the what, how, and the why of their learning. And how can it be applied for future use and success? Students have to connect their learning to the outside world, which seldom happens for struggling or poor performing students. Too often, their success is determined by test score. Learning is a social act and requires educators to provide support beyond the presentation of knowledge and testing. We educate the whole child through physical, language, social, ethical, emotional, and cognitive development. And because learning is a social act, relationships are vital in teaching and learning. Roland Barr, founder and former director of the Principal Center at Harvard University, makes a valid point about the importance of relationships in school settings when he says, the nature of relationships among the adults within a school has a greater influence on character and the quality of that school and on student accomplishment than anything else. If the relationships between administrators and teachers are trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative, then the relationships between teachers and students, between students and students, and between teachers and parents are likely to be trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative. In other words, the relationships among adults in the building set the tone and direction for other relationships between adults and children inside and outside the school buildings. You see, you have to reach students before you can teach students. Now, I wanna focus on the relationship between the teacher and the student. How can a relationship impact learning? And again, why is it so important? When you analyze student test scores, student discipline data, or attendance rates, who are the students who consistently perform poorly? Why do they stay at the bottom? And how do we help them grow and improve? 
Too often, they are poor children, children of color, and children identified with special needs. Where do you begin to reach and teach students who experience failure more than success in our schools? James Comer, a professor of child psychiatry at Yale University and the creator of the Comer School Development Model states, no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. So how do we help students who constantly struggle, fail to learn, they give up, lose hope, or eventually drop out? How do we ensure that these students can learn and more importantly, will learn? I'm convinced we start with establishing relationships for learning. Now, I'm not talking about relationships for friendships or having fun with a buddy. I am talking about the need and commitment of principals and teachers and other school-based employees to establish relationships that motivate and inspire children to attend school where teachers plan and deliver relevant and meaningful lessons and learning experiences. I'm talking about relationships where students know they are expected to learn, do the work, and put forth the effort because someone in that school is there to help them. They know it's safe and even expected to make mistakes because learning can still occur through mistakes. They know someone cares about them as human beings first, then students. Relationships for learning include collaboration with the home, school, and the community to advocate and assist in helping students succeed in the classrooms. It does take a whole village to raise a child. Schools can't do this by themselves, nor should they be expected to, and we need to stop acting like we have all the answers. We need everybody's support. But what is a relationship? Educators generally agree that relationships are critical in their work with children. We use the term loosely, but I wonder if we all understand what it means and how to establish positive and productive relationships for ourselves, students, and families. Establishing relationships isn't an easy or natural task for everyone. It can be pretty challenging and frustrating for teachers and students. The essential question is, what does it take to establish or build personal or professional relationships? I researched and identified what I consider critical elements of a relationship, whether personal or professional. I created a graphic to demonstrate how they are connected. The elements are knowledge of self and others, two-way communication, mutual respect, and trust. Relationships begin with a knowledge of self. How do you answer these questions? Who am I? What do I teach? How do you communicate, manage your emotions, or interact with people? What makes you tick? How do your behaviors and beliefs influence your teaching and relationships with students and other adults in and outside the school? Do you work well and collaborate with others for student and school success? Can you teach a child who doesn't look like you? What about a student that can speak two to three languages and you can speak only one? Will these students be academically successful in your classroom? Do you believe poor children can learn despite the baggage of poverty they bring to school daily? Do you give them rigorous work and assignments? As a teacher, do you have the skills and knowledge to help a slow learner? Do you have the patience to help a slow learner? Can a special needs student pass or demonstrate growth on a standardized test? The answers to these questions help you to self-assess who you are and what you believe about students, teaching, and learning. Your beliefs determine your actions and behaviors as you work with other people's children. Knowledge of self addresses who and what you bring into a relationship is it going to be helpful or hurtful? Relationships begin with know thyself. Now let's move to the second element here, knowledge of others. How do you describe your students? What do you know about them and use as you plan lessons for learning? Do you understand the developmental stages of your students and the characteristics they are expected to demonstrate at certain ages? How should a six-year-old act or even a 16-year-old behave? How do they learn? How do you help a special needs student having an emotional meltdown during a lesson? 
How do you build confidence in a student who's never passed a standardized test? Do you plan rigorous classroom lessons for slow and advanced learners taking the same subject during the same class period? Teachers, learn your students' academic capabilities, their needs and their interests, and how to incorporate them into your lesson plans, instructional strategies, and assessments. Personalize and customize the learning. One size doesn't fit all. Please get to know your students' families, their cultures, their stories. Get to know who they are so you are more prepared to reach and teach them. Tom Sizer, a school reform advocate and leader, stated, to teach each student well requires that we know each student well. Then let's move to relationships require two-way communication. Speaking, listening, writing, verbal, and nonverbal skills. Everyone should have a voice and ear in a relationship. Sometimes principals and teachers, you need to just stop talking and listen. Listen to learn, listen through laughter, shouting, and tears. You also need to listen to hear for what is not being said. Writing is a powerful form of communication because it allows us to process our thoughts and feelings before verbally expressing them. The tone and volume of our verbal communication influence what is heard and how it is received. Calm is contagious and contributes to better listening. By the way, do you communicate high expectations of learning for all your students, including the ones who struggle and experience failure? Do you provide differentiated instruction and support for these students? How do you personalize their learning, especially the students with disabilities? Are students comfortable telling you they don't understand, they need help? Remember, effective communication is two-way, and teachers listen to your students. Now, I like to talk about the last two elements together. Relationships require mutual respect and mutual trust. Adults expect students to show them respect and assume students will trust them. Don't expect people to respect or trust you if you're not willing to do the same towards them. Students must know and feel they are respected and trusted. Age, appearance, academic ability, family background, or socioeconomic status shouldn't determine why or how to respect or trust someone. I googled respect and trust and found these definitions. Respect means accepting somebody for who they are, even when they are different from you, or you don't agree with them. Respect in your relationships builds feelings of trust, safety, and well-being. Respect doesn't have to come naturally. It is something you learn. Now, trust is a belief that someone or something is reliable, good, honest, effective, etc. As the adults in the school, we must model and demonstrate respect and trust through how we speak, our expectations of students, and a strong commitment and passion to ensure their learning and success. Students should also be expected to respect and trust each other to create a positive and safe learning environment. Students must feel physically and emotionally safe when learning, especially when they make mistakes in front of their peers. So let me sum up my ideas and thoughts on relationships for learning. A teacher and student relationship begins with know thyself and know thy students. This knowledge is essential for teachers to plan and deliver lessons addressing students' needs, interests, and abilities. Teachers can differentiate and personalize lessons for various academic levels that motivate students to participate and want to learn. Teachers can talk, listen, and learn from their students while allowing them time to talk and learn from their peers, which contributes to healthy relationships in the classroom. You communicate high expectations of learning and behavior through your beliefs and actions. Communicate with parents and other significant adults in the lives of your students to solicit their support and share student success stories and needs. You earned the respect and trust of your students, and in return, you respect and trust them. They know you care about them and are passionate about your teaching. Your students feel safe and confident that you are fair, supportive, 
and always willing to help them learn. They trust that you will do what is right to guide them to success. Now, I want to leave you with a quote from Marva Collins, an African-American educator recognized by U.S. presidents and internationally known as a teacher, leader, and the founder of the former West Side Preparatory School in Chicago, Illinois, from 1975 to 2008. I imagine she began relationship building when students entered the school and classroom by sharing who she was and what her students could expect of her. Ms. Collins shared, when our children walk into the door, I say, welcome to success. Say goodbye to failure, because you're not going to fail. I'm not going to let you fail. You are here to win. You were born to win. And if I have to care more about you than you care about you, that's the way it will be. I will not let you fail. Who do you think worked the hardest in that teacher learning relationship? It's Ms. Collins, the teacher. Relationships matter. A positive relationship with a student is a powerful motivator for learning. A powerful motivator for learning. Thank you, and remember, the children are waiting for you to teach, lead, and guide them to success.